So this is the first time we're actually doing this live. Um, but before we go into any slides, I want to start thanking our fabulous sponsor for the food. Well, if you're watching this at home, you won't have any food, but we have food. Um, next time, be here. Um, but I really want to thank the sponsor, uh, Centric, for um, helping us out in, in only two days. We're going less than two days to um, provide the food and the, uh, the location and, uh, and the Wi-Fi to, uh, to get this done. So, Centric, really, thanks a lot. I'm not sure if it's going to work uh, with streaming, but we'll see. So I want to give a short inter in State of the Union kind of um, update on the, the current state of WebXR. Um, there's, I think it's growing slowly for the last two or three, three years. Uh, we started the meetup two years ago, I think. This is three, three years ago, I don't know, a, a while back. And... Um, I just want to have a quick look at where we are and if things are working out as they should. So where are we today? Um, I took this from um, um, canaUse.com and the, the show the browsers where WebVR is implement, implemented um, right now. I actually noticed today that this uh, image is already old. Um, but they didn't update Can I Use yet. Um, so as you can see, WebVR is completely integrated in, um, in Firefox. It is. It was fully integrated in Edge, um, but since Edge 97, um, 79, 79, and Chrome 79 are both on Chromium right now. So that's um, and in Chromium is behind the flag. Actually, it was behind the flag because um, they removed it in Haiti, which was released yesterday, I think. Um, they in '79, um, web VR became um, obsolete. Became um, it became clear that they were removing web VR from the browser from Chromium. And in AD, it's gone. Um, but in '79, they added Web VR to Web, uh, Web XR device API. Um, now there are there is some notes here, but I will mention them later. Um, it's not fully implemented yet. But we'll see. Um, and of course, WebVR is also running on the major headsets. I probably forgot the smaller headsets, but I was looking, and that's something I don't know if it's already possible on the PSVR, PlayStation VR headset. I don't think it's not. No, it wasn't. And there's a lot of demand for it, I found, um, because a lot of people want to watch porn on their PlayStation, <laughs> apparently, and there's a lot of push. From that side of the communities to, um, yeah, to get get um, web VR on. Um, so I don't have any demos there. Um, but it is running on the HoloLens and, um, and the browser is running on the, the various platforms. But the big question is, is web VR ready? Should we start using it? Web XR, I mean. Web XR, yeah, the Web XR device API. Did I say VR again? Yes. Uh, they made it complicated, but just Web XR is the yes, it is ready. Almost. There are some details. Um, that you found some information. Um, as I said earlier, in December, Chrome uh, 79, and in January, Edge 79 was released. Um, both running Chromium, so all other browsers based on Chromium that are using uh, Chromium 79 are um, can use WebXR right now. And the old WebVR was deprecated in 79 and removed in 80. 
which meant you had some time to update your libraries and frameworks and now you're too late. Um, and they're not web VR was available in Chromium behind the flag. Uh, and web XR was available behind the flag, I think, earlier. And they removed that flag now and it's just you can use it. But that is actually only the VR part. So we also have the web like AR part, which I personally find more interesting than uh, the web VR. I think there's a way bigger market for the uh, web, VR, web AR in the browser than for VR. VR is, I think, much more fun. But I think the web AR is just that's more use case for the browser, I think. Um, but it's there. It's starting to come. Um, it's being incubated and it's behind flag, so you can um, test things. Um, I think things that, like plane detection will give you similar uh, an ex similar experience like uh, you have with AR Corn AR Kit. You can detect planes, and I think the tracking of things in an AR world will be way better than they are right now, where you have to um, monitor the camera to track things, um, and probably faster as well. But, if you want to use VR in your application today, you can use WebSR. Is what Google recommends. So, is WebVR web VR ready? Google says so. And they own the biggest slice of the browser market, so... I think finally we have um, the first part done and we can use um, WebVR. Uh, yeah, WebVR in the browser. And start building real applications. Um, yeah, and then how can we uh, build and show these applications? Uh, one new one I wanted to show was, was um, Hello WebXR, which is more like a demo, I think, of all kinds of different experience you can use in the um, um, in your browser. Um, I was going to show it, but I think they updated something and it broke. <laughs> So I was playing with it yesterday, and earlier today I couldn't get it to work anymore. I could try, by the way, on this laptop, maybe it works. Oh. And we could try... Have you seen... Have you seen Hello? No, but I can watch it at home, I guess. You want to see it? Mm -hmm. Oh, we, that's, that's yeah. better. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, better. We'll do it later. Yeah. We'll do it later. Okay. Uh, otherwise, I have a YouTube uh, video that shows the same thing. But it's not it's not as cool as having a headset on. Yeah. Um, well, the biggest framework to build WebVR apps at the moment is uh, A-Frame. Uh, A-Frame finally got released to 1.0 with WebXR support and experimental AR support. If you enable the flags in your browser, you can, um, which is most fun on your phone, uh, you can just have next to the VR button, you have an AR button, and you can switch to AR mode and just watch your AR scene in AR, which is pretty cool. You can just walk around your AR, or your, your 3D stuff. I haven't done much with it, but I sure will um, look into it. Um, the next one is really new. I think there's only one person here in the room that knows anything about it. Um, <coughs> I haven't seen much of it, but I read through the, uh, through the website. Well, it's not available to the public yet, so... It's not available yet, but it will be. And I have high hopes that this will might be one of the missing links um, for creating stuff since Unity um, or Unreal isn't, so someone has to do it, and um, all my hopes are on this engine now. <laughs> <laughs> so much pressure. Yes, <laughs> and now the world knows. <laughs> Wasn't a secret, by the way. <laughs> Not <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been looking at all kinds of different frameworks and tools to, to get in this, in this presentation, and this it was one of the, the finest. 
Um, this one I came across was is really cool as well. It's doing AR. Um, Geely's it's open source. Um, it's free to use. Um, you can just do AR stuff or uh, face tracking, which is the face tracking stuff is a bit different than the Web XR API, um, but it is augmented reality um, projected on your face. Um, it's using the camera on your phone, um, and they created a framework to do that. Um, face tracking. They also have object tracking, and object recognition. Um, there's a cache. They have some some data from neural networks on their GitHub page. Uh, but if you want to have integrate in integration with other objects, you have to pay them to calculate a neural net for you. And that's kind of their business model. But I think with only a cup, this one is, is, is one that's free. They have a cup, and you show your cup to the camera, and then they start pouring coffee in it from, uh, from uh, AR, which is really cool. Um, and they have integration with A-Frame 3GS, all kinds of different uh, other tools, which is also pretty cool. You can just hook it into your A-Frame application, and you have um, object tracking or face tracking from A-Frame. This one is also real WebXR, but I think it's really cool as well. Uh, Google created a model viewer, which is a web component that um, you can use to show VR or AR from your website. You just load the, um, the JavaScript and you get this, this HTML component you can use. You drop it in your page, you said I want to show this model and it works. Um, and if you have a device that supports AR, you can just click the AR button and you can place the object on a table and walk around it. Um, so this one, this one makes integration really easy on the website. You just grab a model, drop it in the website, and, and you're basically done. Um, you came with this one, Dominic. Um, the, I think it's a third, the third reincarnation of the JS AR toolkit. Um, the first one got killed by some company, <coughs> uh, almost removed from the web. Uh, the second one was promising. I think it was JS AR Toolkit X or something. And now someone else has picked up the um, stuff and um, started implementing natural feature tracker, natural feature tracking, um, which can be used to track um, images as a marker for logos. And I think that will be a game changer. If they have that working, um, I was working on a demo yesterday and I could have the stuff they had on the website working, but if I downloaded it, exactly that code and run it locally, it didn't work. Um, so yeah, but this one is going to be big. Yeah. And actually that's all I have for now, as in state. So can we use WebXR? Yes, we can, and we should. Um, and all frameworks will slowly move towards the standard. Except for the AR stuff, but it will be coming soon as well. Mm -hmm. And that was it for this part. Jonathan, will you take. Shall I just switch to your presentation? Yes, please. Should be easy. So, uh, first of all, I want to thank Timmy for saving this meetup, <laughs> despite the original location uh, basically just uh, disappearing and so on. Uh, I'm also very, very grateful to be here in general, because uh, like from Munich it's uh, kind of a far stretch, so I'm really, really happy that I was able to uh, afford this from my company, this trip, to be here. Um, also. 
it was a crazy trip to here. It took me 12 instead of nine hours, and like loads of very interesting things happened. I can tell you stories about that if you're interested. So I'm very grateful that it did somehow in the end work out, and I'm here now. And um, I'm going to try a new format for this talk. And it's the I don't know what I want to talk about format, because there's so much I want to be, talk uh, be talking about, because for two years, White Rabbit has been kind of like under the hood and not been going to any events or meetups and actually meeting real people, po posting on Twitter a lot and stuff like that, but basically being a lot under the hood. And um, we just recently started in our podcast to actually talk about all of the things that we've learned uh, over the past two years. Uh, you can find this on Anchor, on Spotify, on any podcasting platform you basically want. And uh, just as a warning, this entire talk is going to be more or less a self-promotion talk because I'm going to talk about Five Rabbit and <laughs> Construct Arcade and our project. So uh, let's start with this. Um, our recent guests are Elijah Tai from Wonderleap, the web VR advertising company, uh, Sven Meinberg from Stromline, who is a WebXR agency in Switzerland, and Fabian Benichou, who are you all? Uh, hopefully no, or if not, uh, he works at the European Union uh, Parliament and UNICEF Innovation Fund as a WebXR consultant. That episode uh, coming out next Monday. Uh, we recently sw switched to a uh, weekly schedule. As you can see, most podcast episodes are rather short, but we made it to uh, 27 episodes now, so uh, we're pretty proud of that. And we still have stuff to talk about. Who would have thought? So to give the talk the name, I call it WebXR Wonderland, you know, follow the white rabbit, we're going to show you our little wonderland that we're building, and uh, uh, yeah, Constructor Kate Wonderland Engine is the two projects I'm going to be talking most of. So, who is white rabbit? What is white rabbit? I'm trying to make, try, going to try to make it short. Florian Zitsche is my co-founder, and uh, that's me. We founded this company uh, two years ago. Uh, originally, though, we started as a hobby team. Uh, fluctuating between 6 and 15 members since 2013, where we started building uh, games with a custom engine on the DK1. And um, we since then switched to uh, Unreal Engine to be able to just compete with the um, XR market in general. Uh, got some contract work there. Finally, our first WebVR project was WebVR Pong, which was a submission to the Virtual Leap Hackathon which was built in C++ as the only game back then and um, was more or less a proof of concept that you can actually build a WebXR game in WebAssembly in C++ mm -hmm. and uh, we're just interested what worked out. I think we came in uh, six or something, like not like super, super exciting there. And finally, we founded the company on the 1st of August 2019. Why? Because we had a grand vision. Uh, our grand vision was Construct Arcade. Okay. Back in those days, I wanted to just try out what was on the web and find all the web VR games to play. But I realized there was no real um, place where I could find all of them. Rather, there was like collect collections like WebXR, no, WebVR back then, directory, and um, Google Experiments, where everything was mixed together. So you had 360 videos, educational stuff, music videos, uh, kind of like non-interactive experiences, and some games. But I really only wanted the one thing, uh, the browser games. And uh, if I built a game, I wanted it to be somewhere where it would be found by exactly those people who are interested in playing the games. So this is Construct Arcade. Construct Arcade, okay, just a screenshot of the website, uh, if, in case you have never been there. If you go, go to the VR Hub, then you can actually visit uh, our arcade in 3D. And uh, basically have a seamless experience without taking off the headset or going to a 2D screen mode in between. Uh, you'll notice yeah, famous yes, games yes, right there, very right? Famous. And <laughs> thanks for uh, having, letting us host the game to me again for that. Um, so, of course, uh, in the beginning, with everything, you have a hen and an egg problem. Uh, if there are no games, there's no players, then there's no developers actually interesting. Uh, interested in making games for a non-existent audience, right? So you have this uh, kind of loop that you need to break somewhere, and we started off with uh, being the developers that make the games and starting a mass uh, players in some way by just providing them. So we build games. Uh, this is all the games we have released over the past two years. 
uh, we used Unity, which works. So okay, we use A-Frame for basically everything else, or C++ for these two games. Um, the most famous is Barstow Express, uh, that hopefully some of you will actually know. Um, it's a game about making coffee, so that's like another passion of mine, combined with the WebXR stuff. I love making coffee, I love pouring latte art and stuff, which you can't actually do in Barstow Express, but you make different kinds of coffee for customers that come in and uh, order something, and you need to like time manage and try to make the coffee on time. This actually got featured on the Oculus browser, which got us quite a lot of users that we were now able to uh, be approached by a company called Wonderly to publish the first web VR ad ever uh, published anywhere. Right. So we actually have uh, Ada Support, a company building like an interactive AI support bot, um, who bought ads in our game to have like a post in a non-intrusive way in our cafe. Um, and now uh, it's actually starting to um, take off a bit because we realized that these ads are best for Oculus store sellers. So if you have a game on the Oculus store, so on the Oculus Quest you made a game and you can buy it there, um, then you can actually buy that through the browser and that's the only single thing that you can actually buy well in the browser. If you have like, we had a VR accessories shop uh, doing advertisement in our game as well, but it turns out that these uh, that if people click on this ad, they get t taken to the shop and they don't put in the credit card information inside the headset, obviously, because that's just like super inconvenient. Um, so yeah, Oculus Store sellers, uh, if you want to uh, advertise yourself in your WebXR game, for example, then go to wonderleap.co and contact Elijah Tai, who is like CEO of Wonderleap and he is a super super nice guy from Canada. Highly recommend you talk to him just in general. Um, exactly, cool. Yeah. So we're also uh, gonna release either this or next week. Uh, it's done when it's done, kind of fashion. Iron Rails, which uh, are intern made. So we taught our uh, person to do a frame, and he does it really well. And now we have a Western shooter where you basically ride along a rail and start shooting cowboys that come towards you. You can actually check that out. I have a preview link for you, non-public, fully exclusive. Then a unannounced game that doesn't even have a name yet, where you have a virtual pet and uh, feed it, play games with it. Um, I can't show you that because that is very, very early Will in development. Will there be a white rabbit? How did we miss that? <laughs> yes. you, can, you can choose between five wild animals, but a rabbit, I think, is not part of that. It's not wild enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is our yeah. next really big game, as in uh, Barista Express was the last, and we released, we released that like one and a half years ago. Um, and this uh, is supposed to with Versa Express back then trying to push the scope of what was possible in WebXR and WebVR projects, this is supposed to be the next step, pushing the scope again in a way that trying to just technically be more advanced than what is out there currently. Uh, this is not in-game graphics, and I put that there, very important. We're trying to, from a mesh complexity, still get to these kinds of graphics, though it's a game about planting on Mars, because they get oxygen for the people on Mars, and so on. So how do we think that we can reach this level of complexity um, or push the scope? Uh, we want to make high performance in WebXR more accessible to a uh, lesser technical audience, also designers and whatnot. This is uh, what it looks like at the moment. Actually, this is a very recent screenshot of it. Um, you can see it has like a standard like engine Unity layout, and uh, you can configure your components on the right, kind of like A-frame components. If you, oops, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fix it. So kind of <laughs> like with A-frame, you build JavaScript components, but you can then configure them in this editor, 
uh, you can move around objects in a WYSIWYG kind of fashion, so what you see is what you get kind of fashion. And uh, then you finally export the game and run it in the browser. That works kind of like this. You put in the assets and the metadata, and then you have fast iteration between your browser version and uh, get feedback to the editor. So you can have profiling in the editor. You can have active reloading. So whenever you make a change in the editor, for example, move an object, you can just make sure that this appears in the browser. To ensure that all of this complexity can run in the browser well, we A, have an optimized binary format that is read, not parsed, by a WebAssembly runtime that uh, also uses WebGL2 instead of WebGL1, leaving a couple of Internet Explorer type platforms behind. But since there's no WebXR platform that doesn't also support WebGL2, uh, that's an OK trade off, I think. Otherwise, we can still support it later on. And the big focus is on WebXR, especially since WebXR is the most demanding platform performance wise. And it's in there. It's in there. Yep, yeah, works. Yeah, it should be perfect. Should be working. And now I'm kind of not. I don't know. It should be working. <laughs> so uh, just to be uh, clear, WebXR here can be replaced by ARJS or uh, ATWAL. So we can, instead of using WebXR, have an integration with an augmented reality framework for the web, for example, that works at the moment and works on more platforms than only the browsers that supports web WebXR, as we heard from Timmy before. Um, so ATWAL currently is one of the more popular ones, especially in agencies, because it does all of the nice features that are on native, but are on web already without support for the, um, from the browser. So it's a, a WebAssembly based library actually as well. Um, detailing that a bit, so your project is JSON, which is nice, human readable. You can actually work with it. Every web developer is familiar with JSON. Your scenes are GLTF, GLB, OGEX, OBJ, all sorts of formats that you usually know, especially GLTF, GLB are the web 3D scene files. Textures, bases, of course. We generally try to compress everything to bases to make sure that it uh, transfers over the web decently. And you can write your own fragment shaders. Um, to get like, instead of foam shading, which we use before, because we think it's a good trade-off in terms of performance, uh, you can just implement PBR yourself or put a water shader there or whatever. And JavaScript, so you can actually do full JavaScript components, harness the entire power of your browser by just like using browser APIs uh, from your JavaScript components and integrate basically any JavaScript library you want with uh, the Wonderland engine. Um, you then pipe that into a editor that runs on your desktop on um, Windows, Mac, Ubuntu, and Debian. Um, you can assign components, set up the shader, set up the scene, and then finally it gets optimized on packaging versus like most other frameworks at the moment on the web, optimize on runtime. So they load all the assets and then optimize on the machine of the user instead of optimizing the assets beforehand, downloading the optimized version and doing that. So that's uh, a thing where we can basically um, put all the optimization, the heavy optimization work on your desktop once, package the game, get it awesome. running smoothly, and then get that loaded by the runtime that is built in C++ as well, compiled to WebAssembly. Uh, it loads the binary scene file really, really fast because it's basically just mapping the memory from the scene file into the WebAssembly memory rather than trying to read or parse any, any JSON format that is basically already done here and just the result is output into the uh, WebAssembly runtime. And um, that allows you to load the assets way, way faster. Um, we have draw call optimization using batching, for example, trying to minimize call, draw calls as much as possible. And yeah, our scene graph and hopefully physics someday will be integrated in WebAssembly. So all the like, heavy performance uh, demanding stuff will be in WebAssembly and hopefully uh, have a performance boost uh, compared to JavaScript there. Next level. <laughs> yeah, we're really trying to like just upgrade yeah. most of everything there. So that's like uh, another like, expanded everything. Could you add other um, custom WebAssembly uh, stuff as well? 
theoretically, yes, that's basically what we're doing, right? We're using our own mm -hmm. C++ API to build uh, our C++ components. Um, but it's not planned to make that public to like a wider audience, maybe for like power users who like really need this kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, but generally, sure, yes, it's, it, it is possible. But that's probably one like usually how this works is like uh, bigger game companies usually license engines and then just like change them and make them their own for this one specific game. That could be one way to do it. So if you're interested in following uh, Wonderland Engine, uh, find us WebEx Art Engine. It's not because we wanted to uh, basically get this WebEx Art. Uh, it's just Wonderland Engine is too long for Twitter. That's why we have to make it shorter. And it's, it's a nice thing. And WonderlandEngine.com has a newsletter uh, sign-up thing. Um, once we have like a public test version, uh, version that we send out like a beta, beta, then uh, that's where we're gonna send it. And yeah, the website is very rudimentary, just be warned. We have partners who are going to help us with the branding, but until then, it's going to look like it looks. So um, the entire point of this talk was to inspire you what you can talk to me about. Since this is a meetup, it's kind of like uh, no one really knows what to ask anyone. So now you know what to ask me about. and what I do, uh, can do that afterwards in like a joint uh, discussion. Yeah, maybe you can okay. also like demo it uh, to us. I, uh, I can try showing yes, you something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, apart from that, thank you for your attention and thank you for being at the WebXR developer community. And please check out our podcast. <laughs> yes. And if you, uh, if you feel like you have something to talk about, about WebXR, then please come on as a guest. Yeah. Um, we usually do them via uh, video calls and then try to each record their own tracks. Yeah, that's uh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm not that sure what we should do next. Um, do you have anything to show or tell? Let's do, I want to do some show and tell to. All the people showing up today. Yeah, but it's not like I'm not at the ready, so not that I can just you know go now. So. I was hoping to can so I can, mm -hmm. that I can show the um, um, ARGS stuff, but that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, I could yeah. show um, a little bit about the game I built and released on the kind of platform. Yes. Um, if you're interested, you if you're interested in. I, I, you already see the presentation. <laughs> That's fine. I'll go um, over it pretty fast. It's not really pre well, not prepared at all for today. Um. There's no link to the podcast on the website, is there? Um, I have seen it's it. On blackrabbit.com, but it's anchor.fm slash blackrabbit in one word, all small. Can you send it to me? So I can drop it in the uh, in the chat for the uh, last stream mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. <laughs> in case anyone is watching. <laughs> um, so yeah, in um, August last year, um, there was uh, a competition which is held every year to build a game in 13 kilobytes of zipped. Uh, code, or actually the whole go game should fit into a 13 kilobytes zip file, which is always a challenge, and one of the categories that's on the challenge, on the competition, is WebVR, or WebXR, and um, normally in the competition you won't have any um, libraries you can use, so you have to fit everything in the... Um, uh, in the 13 kilobytes, but since for writing something with um, WebVR, it write, you need a whole bunch of 
um, boilerplate code to get it to work um, anyway. So they said, well, with Web, with Web VR we make an exception so you can use either A-Frame or Babylon or 3GS, which makes things really easier, or way easier to build. Um, but if you see what people build in 13 kilobytes of code, it's, it's amazing. People build their own 3D engines and games in the 13 kilobytes. It's, it's, I've seen 3D shooters. The, um, the, the level of that people build is, 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 um, is enormous. Um, so yeah, I can, what that was about, I can skip the about me. Um, it's not that interesting. I should look where it's coming. Well, you should plug your, uh, your YouTube channel. My YouTube channel. Yeah. Yes. Well, I can, I can, I can say a little bit about about that. Yeah. Because um, then people can find the whole process there. Yeah. So I run a meetup. Might have heard from it. <laughs> um, and I'm a live coder. Um, and what I do is I just sit behind my computer. I build stuff. I actually build the entire, almost the entire game during live streams. So if you look at my YouTube channel. Uh, youtube.com slash source code um, there is a backlog of all the live streams and the game is in there as well so you can just follow along and uh, see what I did and, I, and explain exactly what and why um, I do things and I do that every Monday and Thursday evening um, and I love JavaScript and m the modern web um, all kinds of APIs web XR is my favorite because I have a little bit of background in 3D, but I'm also using the Web Audio API, uh, which is really fun to use, and I'm also trying to figure out how to use different APIs. Web Bluetooth is something I uh, um, I am going to combine with this game and the new WebXR stuff, with the Web AR stuff, so you can have a Bluetooth gun, and instead of having a VR headset with a gun uh, in your from your controller, you have the real gun in your hand, you place your phone in there and then you can look at your phone screen and shoot the aliens from there. Yeah. I don't think there are games... Uh, I was about to say in VR, but I don't think there are many games that do that at all. No, I did that for the web Bluetooth demo. Uh, Shooting aliens? With a gun? No, no, um, yeah, it's, um, like my own version, but yeah, in AR, with, okay. the, with the web no, Bluetooth, no. with the gun. So yeah, the, the, the one that you were at as well. So I, cool. I've also uh, figured out how to gun it. Um, so in, in the competition there are all kinds of uh, categories. WebXR is, is the one I did. Um, these are a few of my favorite games that, are, that, that were in the WebVR uh, competition. Um, I had this idea of doing like an 80s style synthwave uh, virtual reality type uh, scenery and then halfway through the competition. The first game got released. And I was like, wow, that's almost exactly what I was having in mind. Um, including, including stuff like this. Um, the, 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 the colors of the, of the text in PowerPoint are an exact copy of the colors I use in the game. And it's just, it's just similar to mine. I was like, well, but... So which raised the bar for me to um, make the graphics more, uh, more interesting. Uh, I think this game actually won in the end, um, which is cool as well. You have to shoot spiders and solve puzzles in, in VR, and you're under attack of the spiders. It's really cool as well. Um, I chose A-Frame uh, for a couple of reasons. I did a game in Babylon earlier, and I ran into some things there that were complicated to do again in um, A-frame. Uh, there are some stuff with glowing um, filters and shaders in Babylon.js that are not in A-frame and recreating those is just hard to do. Um, and yeah, I kind of like the way A-frame works. A-frame, um, there is a bit of a different mindset you have when building an A-frame game than doing normal web, web stuff um, because everything is component based. Which kind of looks like the way Unity works with the um, uh, game objects and the model behaviors in, in a frame of entities and uh, components you attach to the HTML elements. Yeah. So it's 
Um, if you want, you can play it later. I'm just going to skip over the demo now. Demo now. What time is it, by the way? I just... Oh, I don't... was... Yeah. You need to sleep in the street. Um, <laughs> so the concept I have, and the way I designed the game. Um, I... Actually, I started um, a week late. I was still on my summer vacation in the French Riviera, um, sitting in the sun, and then the competition starts. You have four weeks uh, to finish it, or one month, uh, and I was, yeah, I was not available, so I wanted to start somehow. So I just opened up one, I started scrubbing down ideas, which turned out to be a really good thing to, uh, to start working on it. And in the end, I came up with two ideas. One was a haunted mansion. So I imagined you walking through a haunted house, and everything that would happen would happen behind you. So you would just, the, 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 the competition, uh, the theme this year was back. So I wanted to start everything at your back and people just hunting you and then you look behind you. I was thinking about doing spatial audio where you actually hear stuff behind you and just trying to scare you, but then I remembered that I had to do it in 13 kilobytes. Mm. And the other one is one I wanted to do for years and I was doing a Space Invaders type game in VR. So I went with the second one. Uh, tools I used were OneNote, just as a note-taking app I always used. I used um, QRef, which is a tool to create like some sort of mood boards. It just plays images in, and you can create an overview of different images. And a storyboard. No, I don't really a storyboard. Just you drop an image in there, you can scale it, and that's it. But it's really just gathering uh, ideas from, from images and just I want to have something like this and just work that way. And um, I have a Discord from my um, uh, live streams and there I bounce some ideas as well to school people from uh, being in France. Um, then for the designing part, um, I use 3D Studio to create models like this. Um, I use some custom scripts to export the models to basically nothing more than a bit of JSON with coordinates, and that's it. And uh, the, um, the, uh, the edges. Um, I used Photoshop a bit to um, basically read color codes, but I always use Photoshop for everything I do with images. Um, I used Shape Tool. Um, to work on the shaders and copen, uh, just to try things out and, um, um, for example, draw the sun that, that's in the back. I just worked on that code in um, uh, copen just to make it really fast, to make a chance to see directly what happens. Then building the game. Um, what I learned from previous years doing these competitions was that it's very hard to reach a deadline. Your game has to be done, otherwise you have not a game that's not playable. Um, so I decided this year to do the game very, very basically, just some cubes that are in the air and you have to shoot the cubes and that's it. Then if that's all I could do, I had a game that was finished. And then I started working and iterating on that and um, creating more and more. Um, I did everything in uh, VS Code, including the shaders and everything. Um, I used ToDo Plus, which is a really handy tool for creating to-do lists. It's just uh, a text file, but it, it colors some based on some some characters basically that are in the in the in the text. So you can get a, if you do a green check mark, uh, you get the strike through to your line. You can really easily manage to see what's done. I'm not sure where you're going. Um, 3GS was something I used. One of the reasons I chose A-Frame was that you can get 3GS for free. Um, if you chose 3GS to do your uh, web VR stuff, you had to. Uh, you had only web VR, 3GS, and now we had A-Frame as well. I had a build pipeline with set up in Webpack, so I can separate all my files and, and keep everything nice and, and clean, and then just kick off a build, and then there was a game. Uh, with one optimization in there that I could also build the entire game in 30 kilobytes. Um, and I created a lot of bunch of code snippets in Visual Studio Code so I can really fast, it was really fast in creating um, uh, the components, for example. 
the first concept is one of the first screenshots. Um, after the first blocky iteration, I started to create the space invaders. Um, in the end, I decided not to do it that way and create it like this. This is an actual screenshot from me playing the game, and I think this is recorded during a live stream. Ah, it's actually me in the chat there. <laughs> yes, this is in the chat. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you actually helped me out I think, with shaders and stuff. <laughs> It's a very small world, this, this web PR stuff. And the game turned out to be really intense to play. <laughs> and really fun. So yeah, if you want to see, doing, see, if you see me doing this live, you have to check out the game. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Well, that's basically about the build. Let's skip that. I'd be curious to see um, how compare using the... Do you have any questions, by the way? Um, I'm not sure how deep I should go into this. It was a presentation for an hour. But, um, they are the components I created. Uh, at least, yeah, the plane, which is just basic. So what I did to optimize everything, you, I cannot load a JPEG or a PNG file. One PNG file is bigger than the entire game. Um, so I created components that just drew something on a canvas and that was placed as a texture on a plane. So, for example, the, the background, you have this, this sun, which is nothing more than just a piece of, of um, it's a canvas with some, some drawing on there, some gradients, basically. Um, and same for the tile screen and, and then the rest is all just, just planes. Um, yeah, it's a snippet. This, these are the uh, two of the, um, the actual. I grabbed the, the, them from the from the canvas and saved them. These are the actual renderings that are used in the in the game. I kind of like my son more than the other one, by the way. Of course. Um, and this is just a few lines of code on the um, on the thing. I opened the the sun up into uh, into uh, all this. Open it up. And as you can see, only this. The, the, the image of the sun is already um, 797 kilobytes, which is not 13. Um, I do have links in the slides if you want to have a look at what they look like. Um, for the wireframes, I use shaders. Um, I find, found a shader that was really close to what I wanted, and I optimized that and ripped everything out. They can do dash lines and animated dash lines, and all kinds of crazy stuff with. with um, Wireframes, I just removed everything I didn't need it and created this, this wireframe loop. Um, one of the biggest challenges was the world generation. I want to have these mountains in the background. Um, to do this, I created this, this um, donut. donut, which is nothing more than a noise with uh, donut drawn on top of it and then just mix together and then you ended up with something like this and then based on the intensity of the of the red of the donut I created um, a vertex in the white space and that's it and then I triangulate between the the, 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 the vertices basically but then I ended up with all this, what's, what's purple here, was also in that same image, because they were just at zero. So what I did was I added an optimization where I removed all the faces that have three vertices in the same uh, Y, height, in the same height. So that would remove the entire middle and everything else that I didn't need. Um, I did have a big purple grid in the middle, um, which might have been optimized some way. Um, but that's just for rendering the wireframe. I had needed wires to have the wireframe. And I, it, it was doable, so I kept it in. It's one of the things I might optimize when I, um, I'm going to update the game. Um, there is audio in the game as well, which I use this very old tool for, which it also has multiple iterations on different platforms. And this creates um, really cool sound effects um, that fit the game perfectly. 
I think this tool is written especially for um, the competition. Someone built this. Um, this generates music in a very, very small way in JavaScript. Um, it's, it's, this is just using the Web Audio API, and it, it's great that it's possible to create a tool and then generate some JavaScript that's small and can uh, produce music. Testing of the game was done in the browser, so the browser, the browser run, runs, uh, the game runs in the browser. Um, there's a new Chrome, or there was a new Chrome extension when I gave the first presentation the first time to inspect and try out different, um, uh, emulate the web PR stuff. Um, I tested on the phone, which is working. You can just look around and tap the screen to, uh, to find. Um, I tested on the Daydream, which has a little controller you can use. Um, by the time I didn't have a device yet, uh, so I borrowed a Rift and I got some help from the community as well to test on other devices. Um, I was going to skip to one of the learnings. Um, so one of the great, one of the things I learned in, in the previous years, I did work with shaders. I had the shaders just written down in the HTML file. Um, I found this this tool GeoZellify, which can um, be used in your pipeline to uh, bundle everything down. Uh, you can have the shaders just in different files. Um, I learned that the controllers work differently between the HST5 and the Oculus Rift. The orientation is, is different. So when you're running the game on a 5, you're shooting into the ground. You have to really twist your arm, I think. I left it in the game. Um, it was too much of a hassle to get it out. And, uh, time ran out. Um, you can mirror the screen with the, with the tool, uh, which I use in the game. And I learned that zip files on Linux are smaller. I actually used the Windows subsystem for Linux to get the game under the 30 kilobyte limit. I went over a few bytes and apparently you can create smaller zips on Linux, which was pretty funny. So what's next? This is probably old. Um, I came in second in the competition. Um, I got some great feedback, which I still have to, um, to, uh, to do. It is on Construct Arcade, if you want to play it. Um, I'm thinking about a V next. I've been talking to uh, to, um, uh, to get it featured on Firefox React as well. Um, and I want to, but I want to, want to have some, some more features in there and features fixed. Um, I have only, I think, five different waves of aliens and they are moving pretty much in the same way every time and they are uh, always in front of you. And I want to do a little bit more that, that they circle around you if, they, uh, if they're going to attack and just, just add a bit more variation. There are only two different types of aliens in various colors. I want to add more better music. I really want to get an AR version where you can really shoot the aliens. And um, yeah, maybe re release it on more platforms. Um, maybe even just, just as, as the package native on the Oculus or something, if that's possible. And that's it. Links. Yes. Actually, miss one. <coughs> to construct, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, okay. Well, I just realized it. it. But the game is open source as well.